Hello everyone and welcome to Edupedia World Videos. Well, today's topic is Conflict Management Continued from Part 1. Today we will be dealing with Conflict Management Part 2. Well, I am SK Puri, your faculty for organization behavior. In Conflict Management Part 1, we had studied what is conflict. We had defined conflict in the organization. We have seen what is the process of conflict and try to understand the conflict of Party A and Party B and what can be their intentions. In today's lecture, which is Part 2, the learning objectives are as follows. Number 1 what is meant by levels of conflict and its relationship with performance in an organization number two what is functional and dysfunctional conflict and how does it relate to performance number three we will be dealing with conflict resolution techniques conflict is a very delicate balance and hence it is very important to understand the conflict resolution techniques. Number four, what are the various barriers to conflict resolution? Why some people are good and some people are not good? And what happens when the conflicts do not get resolved? What barriers are coming? Number fifth is negotiation. This will be dealing from the concept to the skills of negotiation, which is very important in any organization. And last but not the least is effective mediation, the process of mediation. And then last we will give you the references of the books which you have to refer for further study. Now let us first uh, define what is organizational conflict. Because here uh, in this uh, organization behavior subject we are studying organizational conflict and not discussing the conflict on society or conflict in family or conflict within the individuals. We are into the subject of organizational conflict. Organizational conflict is a state of discord caused by the actual or perceived opposition of needs, values and interests between people working together. Wherever people are working together, they will have some differences so that is the organizational conflict because of the working together in an organization. Our conflict and performance are related and hence the study of conflict is very important. Conflicts often relate to the project or goals of a team. Conflicts can affect performance for the better, such as by allowing for the refinement of the best practices. When conflicts arise, people of different views and opinions, they try to solve together the problems and when the combination of collaborative decision making comes, then we adopt better and better innovative and better practices and hence the performance becomes better. Conflict is a very good thing there. These conflicts can hurt performance also if interdependent tasks are executed in an incompatible way. So we have to study what is a functional conflict, what is dysfunctional conflict and how conflict and performance are related. There can be a question, what is a desirable level of conflict in an organization? Managers are probable to be open and encourage different perspectives. We look for ways to improve the effectiveness and functioning of the organization. So we'll view Disagreement and debate as an important part of making the decisions, making them effective. So actually, conflict is not a bad thing. It is we should know how to manage conflict. Because they, when the conflicts are there, people are coming forward. And when the conflicts are resolved effectively, then this is, there is a desirable level of conflict, but if choices are made wrongly, the level of the conflict can come to a dysfunctional level. We will study in detail the relationship between 
level of conflict and performance in an organization. High level of conflict as the conflict level increases to the point where the performance of organization suffers. This is a very high level. So low level and high level both are bad. We will be seeing this in a graph drawn between performance and conflict. The relationship between performance and level of conflict is shown in the next slide. Basically what we want to again insist is that we should make right choices to manage the conflict. Now before we go further we must first define what is a functional and what is a dysfunctional conflict. Functional conflict is a constructive form of conflict. It supports the goals of the group and improves its performance. By functional conflict the goals are supported and performance improved. But we start calling a conflict to be dysfunctional when the conflict becomes a destructive form and hinders the group performance. So when the group performance is hindered, we will call that conflict as dysfunctional conflict. And when the performance is improving, we will call it as functional conflict. Now let us further understand these two things by understanding the dynamics of relationship between levels of conflict and performance. Here in this slide you can see the relationship between conflict and unit performance. On the horizontal axis the level of conflict is drawn and in the vertical axis the performance is drawn. Here beautifully it is shown that below the point A that means when the level of conflict is less, it, the performance is negative even, it is dysfunctional. So we can say that low or none level of conflict in the area before the point A, before we reach the point A in the level of conflict is dysfunctional, people are apathetic, stagnant and outcomes are low. We have reached a point B which is the most optimum level of conflict. This we can say functional and there are innovative solutions coming and this is viable and the outcomes are high. Then again we come to the point C. So we can see when the level of conflict becomes too high after the point C in the level of conflict again the functional T becomes dysfunctional the conflict becomes dysfunctional, disruptive and chaotic and we can say that the outcomes are low. So choices are to be made that in a team the conflict is remaining optimum and you don't make choices that the conflict level goes on increasing to make it dysfunctional or there can be another situation when there is no conflict and you have to induce some conflict so that the parties interact and there is some level of conflict so that we come out of the low level or dysfunctional level. Having understood the relationship between conflict and unit performance, we move forward to the techniques of resolving conflict. Well, here we have given the four basic solutions of resolving conflict. Or we can say resolving conflict techniques. The first one is called compromise. The parties negotiate on the basis of give and take. What it means is, let us say there is a party A and party B having conflict. Something party A gains and it loses to party B. What it loses, the party B gains and what it wins, the party B loses. And hence it is win-lose on party A and lose-win and party B. It is a kind of compromise between the two parties is a give and take process. So sometimes we consider it this to be a good one because both parties have won at least something although they have lost to the other party something but there is a compromising solution to the conflict. The second popular technique is called smoothening. This is very much applied in many organizations. It means suppress the difference existing between parties and emphasize in the common interest, the larger interest of the organization, the larger interest of the team. So it is accommodating, reduces the aggressive feelings, but it is a short term measure only. 
we are we are reducing the conflict by accommodation you forgetting about the conflict as such and you are looking at the larger or the common interest and i say it this is all right for shorter term but for a longer term how many times you can go on accommodating to the common interest of the team those conflicts will uh, come up they show up their face so this we can say is a short term measure only the third problem solving this is a beautiful technique and i recommend this technique as far as possible we should go for this problem solving technique it is collaborative it is that you bring the parties together to understand the problem they identify the problem they understand each other's position so they understand each each one understands the other it is sometimes called creative problem solving creative problem solving may come up because these both parties will try to put their heads together to find out some creative solution some acceptable solution which is acceptable to both parties and hence in this cps creative problem solving tensions are reduced because both parties are trying to sort out the problem by identifying it by finding out various solutions then finding out the most workable or applicable solution which can be applied and then both parties agree to the solution and as the tensions are reduced creative thinking is encouraged challenges are accepted change management is better because both parties have taken part in it there is group cohesiveness increases and awareness in the team is better wherever conflicts are coming because of the cross functional areas in an organization like finance operation marketing sales research and development we should build up some cross functional team properly known as cft wherever cft is encouraged this kind of inter relationship between departments are resolved for example when developing new products or by improving the products or by sorting out issues where various functions are involved cft will be a very good uh, team as a problem solving uh, team and problem solving is a very collaborative decision making process and it is a win win type of situation the last is dominance and confrontation <laughs> uh, in this one party gains over another party this is win lose or lose win <laughs> kind of thing and it may aggravate the struggle an innovative solution may not come you know the boss may impose his dominance uh, in conference and uh, it dictates uh, it is a kind of you know uh, one party winning over the other this type of things can come up between management and trade union also uh, between the uh, manager and the uh, employee but uh, this kind of thing it, it may aggravate the struggle sometime but sometime we have to adopt this uh, process of dominance and a confrontation uh, kind of uh, win lose so one can relate the uh, above four techniques to our last lecture where we have talked about the position of a and b parties as win 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 lose lose win lose 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 or win lose lose win kind of uh, five alternative things that come up as positions of party a and party b which were discussed as the outcomes in the last lecture of the conflict so after seeing this uh, techniques of resolving conflict let us move forward to a very popular format of conflict resolution called kutsa here c stands for confront the conflict that means you are not avoiding the conflict one can avoid the conflict sometimes when the conflict is of very low importance and it is not to waste energy over it but the kutsa format is starting those conflicts where you are deciding for confronting the conflict so c stands for con confront the conflict you understand each other's position both parties they understand each other's position d is define the problem they search for and evaluate the alternative solutions to the problem and the last is agree upon and implement the best solution so this is a kind of uh, creative problem solving of identification of the problem to brainstorming of the solutions to ultimately agreeing upon and implementing the solution it is a problem solving uh, format 
So in this format, one can understand it, it better how the problem-solving format can be applied as kutsa. Now let us understand the barriers to conflict management. The barriers to conflict management are as follows. These are six I have chosen here, which are very much common. First is the poor confrontation skills. You know, poor uh, conflict management skills. Knowledge is not everything. It is the skills that we develop in management over a period of time. If you do not have proper conflict management skills, you will have problems. Poor timing. There is a time to say a thing. There is a time to uh, uh, confront a thing or resolve a thing. There are proper words to resolve. There is a proper place to resolve. So poor timing is one of the barriers. Lack of openness. Uh, when the parties are not coming for the real reason for the conflict, how can you resolve it? Let us be open. The channels of communication should be open between the parties. And when there is a negative climate in the organization, climate and the culture of the organization is very disruptive in the sense that there is lack of discipline, there is too much of negative talk. There's a negative climate is also a kind of barrier to the conflict resolution. Poor follow-up skills means after you decide a particular solution between the two parties, they should follow it up. Last is combative rather than collaborative frame of mind. As we have seen, that collaborative decision-making, collaborative frame of mind in an organization is much more productive than a combative, uh, where people are on the basis of only win-lose or making the other person lose, or it is the lose-win kind of thing. Uh, here, it is a combative kind of thing. But I always recommend in organizations to function properly, they should be collaborative frame of mind, which is very good for the conflict management. Now we are dealing with the negotiation. Negotiation is a process between party and party B. Uh, this negotiation can be technical negotiation or a commercial negotiation. They can be price negotiation or a non-price negotiation. Let us say, for example, there is a, an organization producing power plant equipment and there is a customer for the taking of the power plant equipment. Now, between the two parties, there will be negotiation on the technical terms, on the technical parameters, and there can be non-technical like price and the terms of payment and all that. So, settling these two uh, things properly between two parties is a kind of negotiation. There is a process of negotiation to settle these two things between the two parties. The six-step approach, properly known as six-step approach to negotiation is that when party A and party B are going to meet for negotiation, we must prepare, first of all. The five stages are preparing, second, developing strategy, third is getting started, fourth building understanding, fifth bargaining and then closing of the negotiation. Uh, one should never fight an unprepared war. So when two parties are going to negotiate, they prepare at their own ends, they develop a strategy that which, which people will come, which area people will come for making the negotiation take place and what are their strong and the weak points. Then they get started in the negotiation. During the negotiation, they build up understanding, understanding the other's position and making the other understand their position so that they can have a bargaining and negotiate and closing of the negotiation. Very important because after all, the process of the negotiation, you must close the negotiation with some minutes of the meeting, with some MOU, minutes of uh, eminent of understanding, so that you settle and write down what was the final decision taken during the negotiation. Now we come to the last topic of today, that is mediation. Sometimes it is hoped that disputed parties will resolve their own conflict, or at least they bring the conflict under control. But the fact is that, more often than not, specialized intervention is. This specialized intervention is called mediation, and mediation is a process when a third party mediates between the two disputed parties, Mediation can be a formal, 
which can be standardized formal approach to a dispute, like said making an inquiry board, and it has a process which is very much formal and structured. This mediation starting with small m is an informal process of mediation. Now the skills required in mediation is non-defensive responses, active listening, negotiation skill, and a particular certification or education or training will be better. People are trained for mediation. They go into the dynamics of mediation. They are skilled at mediation. Requirements of a mediation process are that the mediation process should be impartial and neutrality. There should not be any kind of uh, partiality to any party. The mediator should be skilled. Normally, authority figures are not regarded as effective or in neutrality as they have power and they can be used to punish one or the other. So, presently, we see that sometimes uh, parties, uh, they perceive the appointment of an authority figure as a bias, having bias because they can punish and they may have a bias. So, directors and administrators have been views, viewed as good referees but not as mediators and are actually inappropriate for mediation because they are in a position of power. The books that I recommend as a reference are the following four. Organization by T. N. Chawla, Organization by Stephen P. Robbins, a very good book. An Organization Behavior by Dr. S. S. Khanka, Lastly, Organization Behavior by L. M. Prashad. The Indian authors, they give more of Indian scenario, uh, but sometimes it is better to have the foreign author also to get a global picture uh, also on the subject. So having given you the references, I thank you all for listening to me and thank you for listening to the videos of Edubedia World uh, videos. If you like the video, please do subscribe to our channel Edupedia World. For more videos, log on to www.edupediaworld.com. Thanks again.